Good evening, everyone. Um, hi. Thanks very much for um, having us here at the bookshop in Queens tonight. Thanks especially to Tess over there for hosting us here this evening. Um, my name's Lisa, and I work at an organisation called RI Oz, or the Royal Institution of Australia. We run a program all through regional Victoria called Free Range Science, where we bring scientists and people involved in science um, to lots of different sort of community events and festivals and places like this all around regional Victoria to talk about science. So it's an opportunity to find out a bit more about science and also to kind of raise any questions or concerns or anything, any questions that you have, feel free to raise them throughout the night as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Peter. And okay. Oh, just one last thing. We've got Rob here taking a video of it. Um, if anyone has... He'll be he'll be videoing this part here, so um, don't worry. You won't be you won't be on the video. But if if if, um, if anyone has a problem um, and wouldn't like to b b be in a video at all, just let me know, and we'll make sure we don't kind of include you in any of the footage. But we might Rob might take the camera off and wander around a little bit. But don't worry if he does that. Just let me know if you have have a problem with that. That's no problem at all. And now I'll hand over to Peter. Thanks right. very much. Thank you. Hmm. Welcome everyone. I'm Peter Henrihan. I just live up the hill, if uh, anyone doesn't know me. Um, when Tess um, asked me, because I'm a scientist, to uh, host this, because it was about microbiology, and I thought very, back in about history, about 40 years ago, I think I did some microbiology. I don't think I was terribly good at it. It required looking down microscopes, and it wasn't uh, a, um, a great strength of mine. And I remember, I think it was O. Henry did, went to uni and he, had micro, he did microbiology and he um, ran into a lot of trouble with it too. And he failed one year and he was really, the professor was very, very upset at him. He couldn't understand why he couldn't do it. So the first session in the second year, he uh, looked down the microscope and he said, ah, oh, fantastic, I can see something down there. And the professor rushed over and had a look down at it and says, you stupid fool, you've got the eyepiece in upside down, you're looking at your eye. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sort of, uh, my understanding of microbiology wasn't, wasn't much better, but I was able to get through. Anyway, um, I'm um, probably now, I, I am a scientist, but I'm probably a lapsed straight technical scientist. I tend to work more in the area of social science, uh, rural sociology and things like that. Um, I read the um, book and I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's what, he's, what Dan's trying to do from what I can see is trying to make science available to the average person. And what he does, he does that very well with a lot of humour as well. I notice it's got a lot of similarities if anyone's read Bill Bryson's uh, history of the world. Um, it's got a lot of similarities about that. He tries to bring people issues into it. One thing that Bill did though was he spent a lot of time talking about the real nasty scientists in the world and all these famous people who were pretty nasty sort of characters. You took to chapter seven before you started yeah. hanging on to <laughs> Louis Pasteur for not being as ethical as he might have been. So I think he Dan probably wasn't one of those kids who you could say to when they ask a question, just cos and shut up and eat your, eat your <laughs> vegetables. He, I think he would have kept asking questions all the time. That was the way he's got a very inquiring mind. Since I don't like vegetables. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, I, what did I learn from the book? Well, I'm not going to tell you about the technical side of things, but I think that... Uh, what I did learn, that microbiology has come a fair way in the last 40 years. Um, it's a lot different and massive advances and also I think it's going to be a real science of the future by what Dan has to say. 
Uh, interestingly, bacteria have been genetically modifying themselves for millions of years, and they've worked out how they can do it well. They just go around pinching bits of genetic material everywhere and engulf it. If it doesn't work, they just die. If it does work, well, then they, they take over. So that was an interesting uh, piece of stuff that I found there. I might, they're also very dumb but very smart and I think the politicians in Canberra could work about this because what they do, the old Arab saying is keep your friends close but keep your enemies closer, they've got this capacity to uh, have the, the enzymes that are going to kill them within the cell but they also have the antidote in the cell as well and they're able to play one off against each other and I think it's a very, very smart way of, uh, of solving problems. They're also very, I, I've worked in the sheep industry and they just reinforced how important microflora are to sheep in the four stomach animal, animals and also that they're very important for what's going to come in the future when we're trying to stop them from belching out a whole lot of CO2. So microbes are going to play a very big part in that. Um, what I did also find was about halfway through the book, I meet Pet and Dud. They were having a nice cup of tea. <laughs> Do you know who Pet and Dud having nice cups of tea? <laughs> Dudley Moore and Peter Cook. Now I thought this was very interesting if Pete and Dud make appearance halfway through the book, but it also just helps to uh, provide a bit of entertainment on the way. So I think that's a good introduction to me. I found it was a really useful book and what we'll do is have a little bit of a discussion for about uh, 20 minutes and then we'll go for questions as long as you've got questions to ask and we're more than happy to have it fairly free and easy. Dan uh, did his uh, basic uh, science degree in Jerusalem as well as a master's in microbiology he just told me that he's come to Australia and he's supposed to do a PhD in microbiology, but he's got a bit sidetracked and uh, is now in Sydney doing one on history and philosophy of science. So we'd like to welcome you here, Dan, and uh, if you would like to just do a bit of talking yeah. about your book, please. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, Lisa, for bringing me here, and thank you, Peter, for that lovely introduction. And yeah, all true. Um, and I, I really should say at the outset that I'm, I'm uh, reading that passage uh, you mentioned. Uh, it might have been Thurber, maybe, uh, about not looking properly through the microscope and so on. Uh, I sympathized quite a bit. Fortunately, when I was studying uh, uh, microbiology, there wor weren't too many microscopes involved. There, you know, technology has advanced a bit now. Everything is molecular and computerized and so forth. I still was pretty crap at it, uh, <laughs> which is why I switched over to writing books about it, actually, rather than actually doing it. And before reading from my book a bit, uh, I'd like to point out this uh, lovely title, which I found over on the shelf a few minutes ago, called Man, Microbe and Malady by Dr. John Drew, uh, originally from 1940, I think. Yep. So it's quite old, um, but usually titles about microbiology and uh, microbes tend to, tend to go on uh, about this sort of theme as well. Uh, even in modern times. So I'll just read out the contents list. Classification of bacteria, the weapons of bacteria, the entrances and exits of the human body, infection and transmission, defense, resistance and immunity, therapy, sterilization, common infections of the human skin, infections of the respiratory tract, infections of the elementary tract, infections of the urinary tract, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Chapter 19 goes on to allergy and, and counterattack on chapter 20. So this is a text uh, not a textbook, a popular book, sorry, about microbiology. And the entire idea is that uh, microbes will only be spoken about, will only be discussed in relation to what they do to us and specifically what they do bad. Um, so when I read books in microbiology, I, I was struck by the, the, the notion that everybody keeps discussing microbes in this way. 
and learning about studying about uh, microbiology at the university, usually at this focus. And then on the side, there was uh, the notion that there were other microbes doing something, doing things that are beneficial to humanity, doing things that are uh, neutral in relation to in humanity, and, mo and most of them, the large mass of them, doing things that have absolutely no connection to humanity. And these are uh, the majority of species on Earth. Most living things uh, uh, on Earth are microorganisms who have no relation to humanity, and we don't know much about them. They're not spoken of. And what's more, they're very, very interesting in and of themselves. So this is why I had, this is how I had the first idea for the book, just to talk about microbes uh, from, as far as I can, could get to it, the microbial point of view. Just talking about what, is, what would be more important to a microbe, what, what we can learn about microbes that is not solely focused on how they can harm us. Of course, uh, since I... I, I favor the gruesome. There are uh, quite a few instances uh, in which I talk about how microbes harm us and so forth, but I hope to bring something of the microbially centered point of view uh, to, to the reader, and I hope I've succeeded. And I'll do a couple of readings, hopefully not too long. Luckily, uh, I've uh, divided my book into uh, shortish sections. So uh, they're very easy to to write, to, sorry, to read while you're uh, while you have just a few minutes of time, which is what I have now. Okay, uh, first uh, s first uh, section uh, is uh, is how chapter five starts. Uh, uh, chapter five is called "Bugs on Us," and I like this section a lot because uh, of purely sentimental reasons. Uh, I wrote it in an hour during a workshop. I, we were given an assignment, and, and, and off we went, and I wrote this, and it was quite good, and everybody liked it, so it came into the book with just basically unchanged. Here we go. Imagine that a friend comes up to you and says, have you heard? Every microbe on Earth has decided to leave. They've all gone. Had that happened before you wisely decided to read this book, you might have shrugged and said, so, and gone back to whatever you'd been doing. Had you been slightly more knowledgeable, you might have recalled all of these horrible diseases that microbes cause and said, good riddance. If, however, you've been paying attention up till now, you'd undoubtedly realize the full implications of this new situation. Number one, life on Earth won't be remotely the same ever again. Number two, we'll all be dead within days, if not hours. Number three, there's a lot of stuff around the house that we won't need anymore. First two realizations are depressing, so let's concentrate on the third, which will offer up the chance to sell things, make money, clear up some space at home, and generally make life more enjoyable. Turning our mind's eye homewards then, if there are no microbes anymore, what don't we need? Well, most of the big white boxes for starters. If there are no microbes, food won't spoil, so you don't really need a fridge. Milk, eggs, and meat will all be perfectly fine in the cupboard. You may want a small icebox for keeping drinks and ice cream cold in the summer, but that's it. So, Dump the fridge and the freezer. Most of the pantry can go to. Out go the tins. Why bother? Out go the wine racks, because there's no wine without yeast, no beer either, for that matter. <laughs> out goes the water purifier, too. Next, dishwasher. You don't really need to go through all that just to clean some dishes. Give them a quick rinse in the sink, and that's it. Food scraps will no longer make you ill or taste bad, so you can leave them on if you like. Same goes for washer and dryer. Who cares if your clothes have been worn? If they haven't got big, ugly stains on them, you can just go on wearing them. They won't smell, don't worry, it's the microbes on your skin that makes body odor, odor, well, used to. Now they're gone. So, no washing necessary. If you're like me, this will mean you can wear the same shirt every day until it disintegrates completely. Even those of us who enjoy clothes and fashion could probably free up some closet space. It would certainly come in handy for storing the surplus milk if the cupboard is full. So, out with washer, dryer, clothesline, detergents, deodorant, soap, and the entire shower if you want. No need for brushing teeth anymore, so chuck away the toothbrush, paste, floss, and mouthwash, as well as the antiseptic and bandages, all into the bin. We don't really need a toilet anymore, so a lot of expensive plumbing is now unnecessary. And on we go. And that's just the household stuff, of course. When you look at it this way, a huge portion of the march of human civilization can be seen as a series of attempts to ward off microbial influences, while an additional portion concerns the attempt to use them, which will be the focus of the next chapter. We can't review the entire range of human-microbe interactions here, of course, so let's stick to the important, interesting, or especially uncommon ones. And from there on, go. 
uh, having spoken about uh, especially uncommon uh, microbes in this section, like another section, if we have the time, yeah, we've got a few minutes more. Just yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah well when oh, do come in. When talking about microbes, uh, I'm especially asked. I'm, I'm usually asked about the uh, more interesting or unusual microbes and so forth, which is, you know, fine and legitimate thing to talk about, and I discuss them happily, uh, both in the book and uh, and in talks. But uh, for this one, I thought I'd just go to the your basic workhorse of of the scientific laboratory, if you don't mind, uh, known as E. coli. Allow me to introduce you to E. coli, humble resident of our lower intestines that is grown relentlessly and studied in countless labs all over the world that causes nauseating smells in toilets everywhere. Note morbid fascination of author with uh, toilets. <coughs> there is, of course, no such thing as a typical microbe, just that there's no such thing as a typical human being. If we lump some statistics together, we get a 28-year-old Tokyo-based farmer named Muhammad Zhang. So, not really typical. But E. coli will do to begin with, and it will give us something against which to compare some of the more extreme examples of microbehood. E. coli belongs to the Enterobacteriaceae family of bacteria, weighing it in at one millionth of a millionth of a gram. It measures a delightful two micrometers in length and about 0.8 of a micrometer in diameter, lending it a dashing, elegant, rod-like shape, not unlike a small, wriggly licorice bullet. Its hobbies include swimming around and reproducing itself. It usually hails from the lower intestines of mammals, a home that it shares with many other microbial species. But it has been found in many places, usually as a result of being excreted from the intestines into water. As befits its, its station in life, it prefers the sort of conditions that are found in its original habitat. Wet, 37 degrees Celsius, alkaline, and rich in nutrients that it lives off and can and at the same time, it helps our digestive system to process and observe, absorb. Sorry. At first glance, there is nothing particular about this microbe that seems to merit all this attention. True, it is in close personal contact with humans, and it assists our digestive systems, but it hardly ever causes any trouble. There are a few strains of it that have, been, have gone bad, like the moderately dreaded and evocatively named O157H7 but those strains make up a very small minority of its numbers. And it has no particularly captivating features, and yet biologists everywhere grow it, study it, and mess around with it constantly. Why is that? Why is it, what's so special about it? The answer is convenience. E. coli is the perfect laboratory tool. Several properties endear it to us scientists, so. First, it can be grown quickly and cheaply. A single bacterial cell can be left to grow overnight inside a beaker that's placed in an incubator. Next morning, there will be billions of exact copies swirling around in there for us to study at our leisure. Second, you can st store it practically forever in a freezer, then thaw it and carry on using it as if nothing happened. Try doing that with a lab rat. <laughs> <laughs> at which point, my, my wife, from reading the first draft, said, you have to insert a footnote there saying, don't. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> So don't do that with a labrat or anything else for that matter. Um, <coughs> third, it is quite accommodating. It accepts foreign DNA relatively easily. Uh, as Peter told you, uh, bacteria um, and other prokaryotes and other creatures exchange DNA between them, doing like natural genetic engineering. <coughs> Uh, if you have a certain gene that you wish to study, never mind it's, if it's bacterial, human, or any other sort, you can insert a single molecule of it into an E. coli cell, chuck the microbe into a beaker full of broth, I'm sparing you some technical details here, you understand? And within a few hours you'll have a beaker swimming with bacteria containing your desired gene, which you can then set to work on. What we have here, in fact, is a lean, mean, custom-made DNA generating machine. What's more, a slightly different manner of tinkering will have the E. coli manufacturing large amounts of a desired protein out of the gene that you put into it. In chapter six, we'll find out about entire industries that are based on this ability. And, and, and to you, I'll, I'll mention that one of these, ins uh, the, the first instance of, uh, of this technology was uh, manufacturing insulin. Uh, human insulin for, for use uh, in treating diabetes. Uh, up until uh, biotechnology started uh, working up uh, this solution, insulin had to be um, mm, 
taken from pigs, mm, uh, which was of course an inconvenience both to the industry and to the pigs themselves. So uh, with bacteria, it's a lot easier. And fourth and finally, there's never an outcry about cruelty to microbes. Billions of these critters are killed daily, but I have yet to hear of anyone picketing for this to be stopped. Maybe, maybe it's the fact that E. coli is not technically an animal, or it's assumed that since E. coli cell has no nervous system, it can't feel pain and suffering, which may or may not be true or relevant to the ethical discussion. Or it may just be that even the most ardent animal rights activist flushes million them, well, millions of them away per sitting. I suspect that the most important reason is that E. coli doesn't complain or make distressing noises when it's treated, nor do they writhe in anguish, visibly at least, since they aren't seen at all by the naked eye. And in any case, they are neither cute nor furry. That's that. <laughs> do I have time for yep. another short one? Yep. OK. Um, ah, yes, OK. Short-ish, uh, talking about w when we think about microbes, especially uh, us scientists, uh, if I can say that, uh, we think about them as you know, free-floating, swimming around in the ocean or in our our, uh, our beakers and so forth, and just sort of being individuals. Uh, it's becoming more and more apparent that, that that's not actually the case most of the time. So here's a bit called Slime City. I misled you earlier when I was talking about the E. coli. Not the connection. Yeah. The, the E. coli we work with in the lab is not exactly the type we find in our guts. Over time, the lab variety has been bred to become more user-friendly, in particular to lose its tendency to secrete large quantities of a vile, sticky substance that interferes with its handling. This is the story of the wondrous things which we call <coughs> biofilms that are made of this vile, sticky substance. There's something that you yourself spend a lot of time trying to get rid of and a lot of money because you aren't able to. We tend to think of microbes as swimming around in watery places, but that's not always the case. Frequently, a microbe will come across a solid surface and latch onto it with the help of some sticky proteins on its surface. The micro microbe will then start to ooze, secreting a sugary substance that for forms a slimy shell around itself, which other microbes stick to. They start secreting too, and pretty soon there's a whole heap of secreting microbes, busy, thriving jumble of them, layer upon layer, surrounded by a pr protective outer matrix, each occupying a teeny cavern that has formed within the ooze. Have you ever been to an overpopulated city like Hong Kong or a Middle Eastern Casaba market or the less salubrious part of New York? It's a little like that, only with slightly more ooze. It's now estimated that most microbes on Earth live in biofilms, but we still know surprisingly little about them because that's the kind, the kind of dense shut-in structure is very hard to study. Ask an inner-city cop or any soldier who's had to wage urban warfare. Scientists prepare, prefer to deal with easily measurable things like bacterial cells that float around individually in, in liquid. When cells start clumping together, sticking to things and refusing to budge, it's very confusing. You can't determine their concentration properly because they're not evenly dispersed. Meanwhile, it's hard to get it at them because they're protected by that outer matrix. You can't even know what exactly it is you're studying because there are different kinds of microbes mixed up in there, all with different properties. This, as we will see later, also makes it hard to get rid of them. We're not talking about any special ultra-resistant bugs here, just the ordinary ones, but once they arrange themselves in this way, they're bastards to deal with. And arrange themselves they certainly do. Biofilms aren't just a bunch of bugs one on top of the other. Usually many very different species live together side by side, very culturally diverse, the biofilm community, and communicating with each other. Uh, they do this by exchanging all sorts of chemical signals, totally different sorts of creatures understanding each other's language. Isn't that something? <laughs> no, really. Biologically, uh, a fungus talking to a bacterium, which is what happens uh, there often, is like you exchanging pleasantries with a mulberry bush. It's hard for us to tell exactly what they're saying, and anyone who has observed any part of nature at any length could guess that a conflict is definitely part of this game, but the end result is a thriving multicultural habitat, so they're doing something right in there, definitely. Biofilm structures have plumbing, too. Channels run through them that supply the resident microbes with necessary water and nutrients, as well as good communication routes, since signaling molecules also cir uh, circulate throughout them. All in all, it's not as ramshackle an affair as it may look like from the outside. 
Microbes in biofilms don't grow every which way. They arrange themselves so they don't block up the water channels, and they differentiate themselves so that the outer layer is tougher and more resistant than the thriving inside layer. In short, they're organized. But biofilm inhabitants don't always stay put. Adventuresome microbes often detach from the main structure, either alone or in little clumps, to seek their fortune further afield, or further downstream in their case, since they go with the flow. They'd probably whistle westward ho as they went if they had anything to whistle with. Biofilms can be found any place where there is moisture and a surface to cling to. They make rocks and rivers slip slippery. They clog up drains, and they're also a terrible problem in hospitals, where they cling to catheters and refuse to budge, which leads to infection problems, as you would imagine. Because they are constantly sending out new colonists, they then create a chronic contamination problem for people who need tubes stuck in them for any reason. They also form inside our bodies. One particular sort likes to grow on the valves of our heart and cause serious inflammation problems. And it's one reason why biofilm research is gaining a lot of momentum, not to mention budget. Uh, in another form called plaque, they stick to, or plaque, sorry, they stick to teeth, feed on any sugar they can find there, and secrete acid that eats away at the tooth. To be fair, scientists and environmental engineers are also putting biofilms to good use, cleaning up wastewater and other nasty stuff. With their diverse species and abilities, they can carry out a concerted effort that a single species just can't manage. Humans may have viewed biofilms either as useful or as a source of trouble, but that's, what's the point of the biofilm to the microbe itself? Why should a microbe go to all that trouble to hang onto a surface or to form such elaborate structures upon it? One answer is, to quote um, uh, mountain climber uh, Mallory, because it's there. As we've seen throughout the chapter, if there's somewhere to live, something will find a way to live there. And solid surfaces and wet environments are no exception. It's also much easier for microbes to withstand the force of flowing water by sticking together. And the external matrix doesn't only keep things stuck together, it keeps things out too protecting its inhabitants from all sorts of stuff, including toxic metals, dehydration, and ultraviolet radiation. This may be one reason that microbes build biofilms. Biofilms are also more, more resistant to antibiotics. It's not clear exactly why, but it might, again, be due to the protecti protective qualities of the matrix. Another theory is that a biofilming contains small <coughs> subpopulations of microbe cells that can resist antibiotic attack, either because they're naturally resistant or because they're dormant, when the biofilm gets whacked by antibiotics and most of the cells inside succumb, these small subpopulations may start multiplying rapidly, restoring the previous state within a relatively short time. Good for them, headache for us. Biofilms are here to stay, so brush your teeth after meals and visit your dentist regularly. For now, that's the best we can do to keep them under some sort of control. When all is said and done, you just can't beat city life. Thank you. Coming, coming to that last sentence, sentence I thought, I didn't, I didn't remember that this is how it ends, and maybe this wasn't a good idea to read it in clunes. Nevertheless, <laughs> <laughs> apologies. <laughs> I'm a small town boy myself. So. Um, I think we need a couple of take-home um, messages so that people can impress their people when they're at home. And one thing that I, I picked up on the way through was uh, there's more bugs on your keyboard than they are in your toilet, so <laughs> that's one. Yeah. Um, Th there's, a, there's an additional take-home message from that take-home message, is, and that, that is that indeed there are more bugs on the keyboard than in the toilet, and yet people who muck about with keyboards, which is most of us these days, are healthy most of the time, mm. right? So. Presence of bacteria does not necessarily equate to, oh my God, we're going to be sick. Mm. Okay? We have an immune system. It works well. We're thankful for it. If it doesn't work well, that's a problem. And then you have to be uh, quite worried about hygiene and so forth. But on a day-to-day -day basis, <coughs> you, know, you know, if you talk to microbiologists, uh, especially in the media, this is going out. Oh my god, I might not be <laughs> wanting to say this. Oh, what the hell. Uh, uh, they tend to stress the importance of, importance of good hygiene and, and, and washing and so forth. And, 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 uh, I'm the she'll be right type of microbiologist saying, yeah, all right, yeah, but you know, if you drop some food, man, it doesn't matter. So uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm sort of the mm, reactionary microbiologist. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, might not be a healthy idea for me to, to keep on doing this. But I have evidence. I have a two and a bit year old son whose hygiene practices are, by any Western standards, abhorrent. And he's the healthiest little kid you could imagine. Mm. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah. it does help that he, he up until about uh, quite an advanced age, he, he got uh, nutritional and uh, immune supplements on a five or six uh, times daily basis, uh, more commonly known as breastfeeding. Yeah. But uh <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, Any, but anyone uh, else? We might open it now mm -hmm. to uh, questions or comments. Anyone? Got a question or I comment? I think I'll put this back and just speak more loudly if you don't mind. Yeah, that'll do. How often do you suggest people clean their floors? <laughs> <laughs> As I said, I'm not a clean. Well, I'm, yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a doctor, uh, and you know, if if you do fall ill, don't come running back to me. But uh, my advice would be: as often as you feel like. Yeah, as often as you feel comfortable. I, I, I really do think that we're, in terms of hygiene, we're, we're okay now. So just have your floor as clean as you, as <coughs> as you feel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and th there, is, there is something called the hygiene theory, which is uh, still very much you know, in debate and under research and so forth, uh, which says that being too clean is a problem because a biological mm -hmm. system you know, is not a physical one. Y it's not just a cause and effect thing. There's a lot of feedback going on. You know, and we need, uh, our immune system doesn't work on empty. You don't, uh, you're not born with a complete immune system naturally. And it develops, it doesn't develop according to some pre-programmed um, plan that you have genetically. To some extent, yes. To a large extent, yes. But you also need that impact of outside infections. Okay, microbes coming in, being presented by the special uh, um, elements uh, that, that are in charge of it, of the immune system, to other uh, elements of the immune system. Going, okay, Th know thy enemy. This is what you're, you're up like, you're up against. And, and that whole interaction between us, our bodies, our immune systems, <coughs> and the outside world is very important. Okay? That's, uh, evolutionarily, that's how it, uh, it came to be. And that's why... It is now, um, n now some, some uh, scientists uh, argue, this is why having too clean an environment basically creates um, uh, an immune system that doesn't know how to handle the, um, the, the threats that do, you know, once in a while, the serious th threats that do come uh, your way. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Oh, some more here. Oh, well, I wrote an entire book on that. Oh, uh, just yeah. The one. <laughs> just the one. And any specific one? Tess wants the microphone. Sorry? Tess wants the microphone. I reckon you can tuck it. Watch so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so, did you have any specific breakthrough in mind? Hmm. One example of a paradigm shift. Oh, you put me on the spot there. Uh, okay, here's one just from the, the, the last couple of weeks, actually. So I'm not, um, since it's from the last couple of weeks, it's not uh, properly verified and so forth. And you may hear that it was just an artifact after all. Nevertheless, it made news, it made uh, uh, Nature, which is a, a famous uh, scientific journal, of course, leading one, and also made uh, national newspapers. And it goes something like this. Uh, here in the book, which was, you know, the, the, the I, I researched this book uh, a couple of years ago, even a bit more. It says, and I quote, a period in which microbes first appeared on Earth 3.8 billion years ago which is a few hundred million years after the Earth sort of settled down um, um, physically. Period during which they had the place to themselves, about three billion years. Which means that if you take the age of the Earth, this is when, when this is the present, okay? This is, a, you know, origin of life was somewhere around here, according to estimates. And origin of multicellular life, 
multicellular being anything you know more complicated than, than an amoeba leading up to us was somewhere around here. Okay, so this entire period, or thereabout, was the Earth was entirely dom not entirely 100% microbial life. Okay, now it's only like 90% microbial life, and the rest of us get to hang on as well. But this 100% microbial life, it is now said that the origin of multicellularity was actually shifted back up to around here. Yeah. Which is amazing. And so, of course, this entire thing wasn't you know, frogs hopping about and so on. Uh, but multi apparently, if this is true, then apparently the affinity of, um, of life for creating complexes and cooperations and bundling together and specializing and doing all these things that, uh, <coughs> that we as multicellular beings are, just having not one cell being on its own, but having specialized cells and so forth and so forth. The affinity of life for doing this is a lot larger than we thought it was, which is intriguing, I think. So that's, that's a sort of paradigm shift, I think. And again, you know, we will have to wait a few years for, for people to figure out whether this is actually true, what are the implications and so forth. But uh, yeah, there have been some fossils found that, uh, hang on, <laughs> didn't expect this so early. This is one of them. Okay. Yeah. yeah getting, getting back to the, um, the, the too clean an environment, uh, we, we drink rainwater um, only and stuff. But every now and then when you, when you realise that the rain is actually going out down the outside of the tank instead of into it, um, and you clean out what's in the sieve at the top, it's pretty interesting at times, but it must be about <laughs> seven, maybe eight years since our family of six last had a gastro. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a, and there have been a few bounce through. But, um, and also there's some research recently, uh, they're looking into the um, connections between slum life in the Philippines and very low rates of diabetes there versus the, the affluent areas of, of the Philippines and uh, much higher rates of, of, uh, of uh, diabetes as to whether part of it's, it's, it's the, 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 you know, the, the less clean environment sort of thing. That was something we read recently. With, uh, uh, with the yeah, the, the, the yes, natural yes, explanation food, food natural so explanation would be that they're just eating less sugar and fat yeah. and, and, and stuff that's bad mm. for you. Uh, uh, yeah, it, this, this article was, yeah, was concentrating on, on, on a clean or versus environment and that they were looking to do. Yeah, I know. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, um, you know, no, I, I cannot I offhand think of a connection between diabetes mm. and hygiene. Hmm. In I'd like Britain, to see it. In Britain, you know, during you know, the poor, poor and richer classes of the you know, 14th, 10th century, whatever, but the, the peasants as such were much stronger, mate, because they mm. ate better and all the vegetables were the, the, uh, the upper class. Mm -hmm. the they considered vegetables beneath them and they ate a lot of rich food, so their mortality rate, I think, in some respect, was higher than the peasants. There's and they had, le they had more disease than peasants because they had all this roughage, they had turnips, was, you know, all that kind of thing. And they, lo they lived a bit longer in one respect, even though they were prone to some other mortal things. Yeah. But the peasants' diet was a lot healthier than, than the rich diet. They had all that, because they had, their things were very high in fat. There's also a, a couple of other factors I I going into that. Uh, first is that the peasants lived longer and so forth, those of them who survived past the age yeah. of five, because yeah. mortality rates at, at that time. Well, yeah. like yeah. yeah. not there because, mm -hmm. because they ate very, very high roughage food, mm -hmm. It could also show it again, but even so, besides the byproduct was that they are a lot healthier people. They skip, apart from the plagues that, um, that did go, that affected <laughs> everybody because <laughs> nature's no discrimination to anything or anyone mm, well, or any class of people. I mean, logically, did. that's not quite true. Well, <laughs> you know, the Black Plague and, and, and of course, during the time of um, Pharaoh, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, uh, and so forth. But the, the diets were much better for the the poorer classes than they were for the rich because they had more high fiber vegetables whereas the rich didn't consider. Not only that, but if you lived in the country and you were a farmer, yes. your food was a lot fresher. Yes. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you know, fresh food is, oh nice, you know, it's a day fresher or a week fresher or a month fresher. It's, I, I still, you know, I shop at the local supermarket, what can I do? Or I go to the, to the big market, uh, but a farmer gets his like that. And back then, when there was no refrigeration, that meant, if, if we're talking microbiology, that meant that food would spoil to, to a certain degree, uh, probably quite large by the time it got and to the table. And that's where they, the disobesians, especially them, they use a lot of herbs. A lot of spices. Yes, yeah. so you could mask the flavor of the meat. Not just the flavor, and I, and I talk about that in, a, in, in the book. Yeah. Uh, spices also have um, 
antimicrobial activities. So uh, y you, there's yeah. a reason why we 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 smoke things and want to smoke you know, meat and, and salmon and so forth, and why we uh, uh, make jams. High <coughs> sugar concentration kills off microbes, and why we put salt, um, you know, preserve with salt and so on. Also antimicrobial and pepper and so on. A lot of these spices that mm. you mentioned are uh, garlic especially as well. Yeah, rosemary, king of the antimicrobials, garlic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, rosemary is another very old. Yeah. And, and of course garlic. Mm -hmm. right. And a third, uh, if, if I just make briefly, a third uh, uh, factor why farmers might have been uh, healthier is that evolutionary we're descended from apes. If anybody doesn't agree, then they're welcome to, uh, to uh, corner me later and then beat me up to a pulp. Uh, but we, <laughs> we, we grew up with ape diseases, grew up as a species. So, and and a, a successful microbe isn't one that kills you off very quickly. A successful microbe sort of hangs around to reproduce more through the ages. So what you get is uh, um, a microbe uh, infecting a, a, an animal. And at first there's, this, there's, there's fighting and it either dies or the animal dies. Or throughout the ages, w uh, throughout the infections, there's a sort of compromise and truce. And you know they sort of get along with each other to a certain extent, and, that, and they both s somehow survive and, and, and prosper. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they get to depend on each other uh, for stuff uh, after millions of years have passed. And w new uh, illnesses, new infections, new types of infections coming uh, to the human race, Black Plague, for instance, and other diseases, usually come from, um, n not from uh, monkeys and so forth, or from uh, ourselves, but from uh, rats, uh, domestic animals, even cows and so on. Pathogens that can ha jump the species barrier. They do that very, very rarely, which is why you get a disease, you know, a new disease once every few decades or few centuries rather than once a week. But once they do, then it's very virulent because, you know, sometimes, not always, but y the immune system doesn't know how to handle it. And so it's, it's very foreign. And then you have the, and it doesn't know how to, how to protect against it. Um, so what you had with the farming uh, lifestyle is people getting exposed to these <coughs> things on a more regular basis. And, and you could sort of build up an immunity better. Uh, whereas a city gent uh, being exposed to it for the first time uh, as an, uh, uh, if it's a, a full-blown uh, plague outbreak, would have you know, got it full in the face, uh, the very long type, you know, which might have uh, Explain the higher morale, well mortality. Look at the smallpox, the, 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 the story about the milking maid. Yep, exactly. And the cow, her is, she can get it. Yeah. Mm. And, um, Case in point. Well, yeah. Exactly, and that's how vaccines oh, were developed. Yeah. Just like Pasteur, and the Pasteur had a look at another man. Mm -hmm. You go for this, then go. Oh. I forget now. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, oh, sorry? Go on. Oh. Goodbye, Alison. You were saying about the structure of the microbe amongst its many uh, structures. It's encased in a matrix, mm -hmm. which is very difficult to get through the matrix, yes. to study it further, I think you said. Mm -hmm. um, if medical science were to find a way to break through the matrix mm -hmm. in this day and age, mm -hmm. would we be closer to any better medical knowledge mm -hmm. of curing diseases? If we, if we could get close up and personal to that, mm -hmm. would the breaking through the matrix be a breakthrough <laughs> in medical science? <laughs> yeah, literally, once, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to stress that this is not every microbe. It's, uh, uh, the biofilm is a type of, of structure of, uh, of community that you can find commonly, but it doesn't mean that every microbe uh, works like that. And furthermore, uh, if you do get infected, then it's usually not by a biofilm. Uh, you, you, you get infected by a single or uh, um, a number of, of, of free uh, floating, or free uh, swimming uh, microbes. Um, and, and I would like to stress that uh, we're talking about bacteria here, not viruses. Viruses are an entirely different class of things and uh, viral diseases are, uh, I, I touch upon uh, a few aspects of uh, viruses and virology in the book, but they don't form biofilms <laughs> at all. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's ridiculous to think so. Although, you know, in 30 years, maybe we'll find something interesting uh, that 
respect. But for the trouble that biofilms do cause, then definitely, uh, if we could find a way to sort of melt down these things and so forth, then yes. And we have the technology. You know, we can do that in a number of cases. Uh, it's usually a case of doing that without harming anything else which we want, you know, floating through that tube or, um, you know, or, or in your heart valves or anything like that. Doing that specifically, targeting the drug delivery and so forth, which like in many other diseases, you know, can, uh, cancer to name a, a very prevalent one, is the problem in, in cancer. You need to take out the infected, the, not the infected, the, 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 the bad, bad uh, cells without harming your uh, ordinary ones, which aren't, you know, causing uh, any trouble in... in uh, that in doesn't always work because what happens to the cancer cells also affects the other bits so that after yeah. the chemo is finished, yeah. you have to re re rebuild your... you virtually have to rebuild your... Exactly. So in, in cancer, it's extremely difficult. Yeah. We have, uh, as a microbiologist, you have the... Uh, you're at least comfortable in knowing that a bacterial cell is very, is very different to a human cell, which is why antibiotics work. <laughs> you target a process in, inside bacterial cell DNA replication, blah, blah, protein manufacture, which works in a fundamentally different way than in humans. So you take out that piece of machinery which doesn't exist in humans, so it's very specific. Uh, in cancer, you don't have that luxury. Uh, but yeah, if, if we could do that, and when we will be able to do that, then it'd be lovely, indeed. Okay, here. Uh, yes, I apologize for being like we've been to a, on a diabetic, we've been to a diabetic uh, all day thing at, um, at uh, Campbell's Creek today mm -hmm. and uh, just for your information I didn't bring this up because you said you, you knew nothing about germs causing it well that was true it's a disease they stressed that all the way through uh, oh, very mm -hmm. interesting thing and I thought we had time to fill in so we went back into Castlemaine mm -hmm. and before we got out of the car I looked in the plate and I thought it was six till nine mm -hmm. and it was uh, five so we didn't it was something to five then so <laughs> we had to go like a cut cat and had to go and buy a map to find it and <laughs> every way I, everywhere I pulled up and asked a couple of people and one fellow put us right and we finally got here but after getting bushed for a bit <laughs> so that's why we were late here but um, uh, on the uh, I've often wondered and I, I think a lot of the scientists agree with this and I would like to know your opinion on this we're kids uh, are kept out of the dirt and mud and all this sort of stuff mm -hmm. and playing in the dirt like I used to when I was a kid mm -hmm. and you'd fall over and you'd cut yourself or something scratch yourself and you'd pick up all the logs and whatnot <laughs> and you'd, be, you'd get a, 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 a resistance to it as you grow up and later in life. Do you agree with that or, or not? Or mm. Rather than keeping people, kids, keeping kids away from say mm. possible germ filled things and keep them inside playing with those dirty keyboards. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> or, or what? yeah, good point there actually. <laughs> okay, uh, I have two points. First of all, about the diabetes thing. Uh, it is interesting, and I don't mean, oh, interesting, I don't think so. Oh, it is actually interesting. And you have examples of it in medical history where uh, you'd think, as a microbiologist, uh, I'm like, yeah, see? Because you had uh, diseases that were thought to be completely unconnected to any outside infection, yeah, no, that's a disease of the body, it's a physiological thing, and then uh, you figure out that actually infection does have something to do with it. Classic example is uh, ulcers, of course. Uh, I, yeah? Ulcers. Oh, stomach ulcers, stomach yeah, stomach. yeah, peptic ulcers, which until around about the 1980s, you know, I grew up uh, as a kid, you know, you know, stress causes ulcers, that's it. You know, uh, secreting stomach acid and you have a stressful time, that's, that's how you get ulcers. And then, Two uh, Australian scientists from, uh, from Perth. Uh, uh, I, I talk about this incident uh, in, in, in chapter seven. Did a very very interesting study. They had a they had a notion and they tested it out on themselves uh, and got Nobel Prize justifiably, not just for testing out for themselves on themselves, but because they had the notion right and, uh, and they got it right. And it appears that infection does affect ulcers. It's not the only thing that does, but it's a very, very major component of that particular condition. So, and, and suddenly the whole paradigm, the whole, the whole idea of how to treat peptic ulcers changed within 20 years, which is, you know, as far as I can tell, is, is you know, a good on you for, for medical science to sort of sh change direction so very quickly. And you know, it was a very lucrative trade in anti-ulcer uh, 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 medication now it's heading the other way. You can just treat it with antibiotics and uh, so forth. So disease, uh, there is that sort of idea uh, or these continual discoveries that microbes affect things that 
we didn't think they affected. Coming to your second point, we discussed this, the, the hygiene theory and so forth before. I'm, I'm not sure if you're uh, present or not, so it does lead to that. I would like to say, though, that you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd want to say that, yeah, going out, mucking about in the dirt, would, it builds up your resistance, so forth and so forth. However, it's, it's very much a societal issue because if you have kids mucking about uh, in the dirt and doing so and so forth, they do, at the early stages, have an increased risk of infection and having very difficult problems. So if you have five kids, you can <laughs> sort of <laughs> <laughs> somehow stand to lose one, you know, or, or the danger of, it's this, I know, I, I'm a father myself, so of course it's not as easy as that, it's never easy, but y y y you, you can so somehow, as a society, not as a father and mother, per per uh, perhaps, but, but as a culture, you're prepared to take that risk. You know, like sending soldiers off to war. You, you send uh, some people off to get killed and wounded, not surely, but possibly, in order to save others. At least, you know, if the war is a good one. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, so it, y you're prepared to sacrifice, to, to, to take a number of, uh, to take a certain uh, chance uh, in order to, to, to gain back something. If you have just the one child or just the two, which is what what modern society, you know, Western society here in Australia is, is going for now, uh, then risking that, just you know, saying, okay, yeah, go run about and so, so forth, and here she gets that disease, and that's it. <laughs> You've lost your bet, and it's your, you know, you, your, only, um, your only token. So it's, uh, again, as a father, still of one child, uh, I, I let him do a, a lot of not very hygienic things, uh, but I'm, I'm worried, worried that you know maybe I'm taking it too far, and you know some things. No, no, don't touch that. Okay, no, it's, that's that's too nasty. But there's got to be a happy medium, otherwise yeah. you get kids in psychiatric areas who are obsessive and they can't touch knobs and toilet doors, and, and I'm not fooling. Mm. That you get this serious, like you get the extreme. So you've got this a happy medium, like you mm. teach a child, mm. wash your hands before dinner, wash your hands before you go to toilet, and after toilet, and, and think they're sensible. Main, main, main rule. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on the happy medium. I don't know where the happy medium exactly is. I yes, wouldn't be well qualified. Well, you know yourself. <coughs> think, well, yeah. I think that's mm. enough. Now come in and do that. That's that's enough. You know, you're too yeah. late, or you're because you get a cold because you're in the water time. Yeah. It's a bit cold mm. in your feet. But I will like interrupt you for a second, yes. and, and because I want to take that psychiatric thing, uh, and, and 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 it's it's another I intriguing example, schizophrenia. Uh, apparently <coughs> has something to do with uh, microbial infection. A uh, whole host of psychia psychiatric conditions are influenced by uh, infections we get. There are, of course, you know, brain viruses of the brain and of men meningitis and so on, and infectious diseases of the brain, that's, you know, that's, that's well known. But there are other subtler um, um, infections that can, are not, they don't noticeably eat at your brain, but they can influence our behavior, yeah, usually to the worse. Uh, and it's been demonstrated very well in, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of uh, worms and uh, parasites in, in other animals, cats for instance and so forth. And it's getting more and more evident that there is an element of that, of, of microbial in, uh, infection in uh, some uh, psychi psychi psychiatric conditions. Sorry, of course, nobody is going to say, yeah, you're crazy because you got infected by this. There's a whole host of, uh, of, uh, of parameters to be considered, but there's a bit of that. So, yeah, microbes can literally make you crazy, apparently. Is this due to chemical secretion by the, um, uh, I'm, I'm balancing brain chemistry? Uh, everything is due to chemical secretion, because, you know, <laughs> that's what they do. It's yeah, like <laughs> so generally, yes. Uh, the, there's a very interesting evolutionary story in, 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 in that, you know, how they came to be, for instance, uh, a brain parasite of uh, mice that makes the mice uh, less aware of danger. They lose uh, all these inhibitions, so they'll go out and trot out in front of the cat, okay? Mm -hmm. The cat eats the mouse, the parasite enters the cat, <laughs> is, and it's a part of his life cycle, of its life cycle, of the parasite, to be eaten by cats. 
So that uh, that ability to to uh, make the the mouse uh, more susceptible to cats is a part of its uh, adaptation of its mechanism of its lifestyle, if you will, <laughs> if you will, and and uh, a parasite of ants, for instance, uh, again a brain worm. Uh, that makes it go up the stem of the, 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 gr uh, the grass uh, in the evening, waiting for the cows to come over and eat it because it wants to enter cows, and then it gets secreted by feces and so forth. I mean, does does, does the, uh, the, the mouse parasite getting into the cat, does that then make the cat more susceptible to cows? No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it doesn't go upwards, it just goes in a cycle. <laughs> <laughs> like malaria, you know, you have the mosquito biting people and, and, and then back to mosquitoes and so forth, and just like that. Mm -hmm. Because the bug is inside the female of the mosquito. Yeah. Also, the males, but let's not get into malaria here. No, I'm saying that the, 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 this mosquito doesn't really manufacture it, it picks that bug up and it sits in its stomach and then it just goes on, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Just Sorry? sort of on a different track. Mm -hmm. yeah. You talked about. I really <laughs> was. No, <laughs> there's a reason why I left. But, but again, and then you started writing about it. Um, so here you are talking as a, as a microbiologist, mm -hmm. and yet you framed yourself earlier as a writer. Yeah. Um, so you said, Ah, what am I really? Yeah, and, and I guess part of what I'm thinking about is just the question of, as a writer, mm -hmm. um, what kind of need are you feeling mm -hmm. in terms of is it satisfying we're all curious about this stuff well with you kind of thing so if, if you, have, you have a readership but is there some way that you feel like people should know more about microbes or your science populace mm -hmm. I, I, I feel like I should be cornering you later and you know giving you the ten dollars I gave I, uh, I, <laughs> I promised you for asking that question uh, <laughs> or something like that um, Okay, first of all, defining myself, uh, you know, I try not to do that, uh, except in the middle of the night when you know, <laughs> I can't sleep. But <laughs> I have a wife, she does that for me. Um, no, I, I personally, I started out in science because, you know, it interested me and I thought, yeah, I'm going to be a scientist, just like my dad. And, uh, and it, it, you know, I still find it interesting. And then when we got past the theoretical stuff, you know, did a BSc and was quite good at it, no problem studying tests, exams, cool. Except for microscopes, no, not that good. Which, you know, was the first inkling that something might be wrong here. Then went off to do a master's and was okay with theoretical stuff, didn't quite get the laboratory thing. It was all right, it wasn't brilliant, and I wasn't enjoying it at all. There's, when you, when you, perform science, you, you work, you know, the pay is not really good, the hours are not really long and so forth, uh, but you do have what Richard Feynman called the kick in the discovery. When you sit down, 8 p.m., the results have just come from the, you know, the, the machine, and you know something very small about a protein in a microbe that nobody else in the world knows. And it's not like you're g going to keep it a secret or anything, but you've found this out, sort of wrenched it from nature, and now it belongs to humanity. And it's a thrill, my father says, it's not the greatest thrill in the world, but it's a thrill like no other. You know, it, it doesn't compare well with other things. It's not like earning a lot of money or like uh, uh, raising a child. It's, it's, it's a unique kind of feeling. And I had a bit of that, uh, but I wasn't in the process was too long for me to enjoy the end result, so I said, Okay, I'll keep this on. And at some point in my personal history, I got offered, got offered, I banged and banged on the doors <laughs> until they let me, uh, <laughs> uh, transferred to a philosophy, history and philosophy of science degree, which I'm enjoying much more. And it's not science, uh, it's uh, humanities, it's ours. Instead of studying nature, you're studying scientists who study nature. So, and you, you know, read a lot of books and articles, you don't go to the lab. And if you do go to a lab, it's to observe other scientists. Sorry, to observe the scientist, which is sort of weird. 
Uh, um, but you know, they, they give you a bit of money for that. Uh, so this is sort of what I'm interested in. And in parallel, the opportunity came up, and this time they were banging on my door, which was quite surprising for me. I d had no idea that anybody would want to read what I wrote, especially since this, this is for me a foreign language, as you may have noticed. Um, so, and when they said, yeah, this is actually quite good, we can, we can, we can make a book out of it, I said, right, <laughs> cool, so I did. Uh, and it all leads, for me, uh, if coming back to the definition, uh, what I want to do in this world, if, you may, if I may <laughs> sum it rather grandiosely, which is to make people aware of what's going on. To make people aware of what's going on in nature. There's all this cool stuff. I was sitting in uh, introductory microbiology in my master's and saying, why haven't we been told this? <laughs> why don't I know of this and that and the other thing? Da, 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 da. I went through an entire degree in medical science. Nobody told me about the, you know, the other 95% of the, of the living world. And they're doing all this amazing stuff. And they have these capabilities. And they have this influence. And they have this and that and the other. You cannot see the world properly unless you know this, <laughs> and nobody's telling. So, well then, you know, so I wrote a book trying to give a sliver of that um, perception of that worldview. Uh, and I'd like to continue doing more of this, maybe in microbiology, maybe in other uh, areas of science, making people like yourselves, like any, anybody who'd care to read it, uh, making that knowledge accessible, making that, and I have a small agenda of making that worldview, a scientific world, world, sorry, worldview, even evolutionary worldview, accessible to people without going on about, oh, hates and human and, and you know, God and whether there is or isn't. Wait, you know, let's talk about the basic stuff, how nature works before we start getting philosophical. So that's, that's where I come from, if you will. There was another uh, question you actually asked. <laughs> I'm not sure I that. Um, do you get feedback from scientists who go, come on, it's more complicated than that? Um, no, and cool. I, I was fortunate enough to, to have um, uh, uh, Peter Doherty, Professor Laureate Peter Doherty, uh, um, launching my book, and I was scared. Oh my God, he really <laughs> knows this stuff. It's not like I'm, I'm just a faker. In that. <laughs> he actually knows what he's going, what he's talking about. He's, and he, well, he launched it, so he was favorably inclined, said some nice things. And the, I haven't been talking to a lot of scientists on this. You know, they're, they're in the labs doing science, and I'm you know, pilfering their results from them. Uh, but th there's a distinction between doing scientific work and popularizing. I have tried my utmost best, my hardest, and I think I've succeeded in that respect, not to dumb it down. Okay? I present it in uh, what I think is simple language, and I leave out a lot of technical details, but I say that there are technical details involved, and you know, it's more complicated than that, blah, 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 blah. But what I do present, I present in, I present in all its complexity. And I, I, I made a point of taking the reader when it's a bit complex, so I, you know, hand in hand, step by step, until you get to the, you know, to, to the point. Uh, and it's a difficult job, of course, which is why it took me a year rather than a fortnight to write it. But uh, it can be done. You know, if you strip away the terminology and you work at it, you people are intelligent. They just don't know the words. So no problem. We'll teach you the words, we, or we can make do without the words, and, and you'll understand. It's not a problem. Do you find this being used Sorry. in tech school? Can yeah, we just just add this little man down? That's how many different types of microbes are found every year. That's an interesting question. Um, it depends on the year. You know, the, uh, 30 years ago, there were less people doing that yeah. than there are today. <coughs> and now we have, we have technology, which is a lot more advanced. Well, yeah. Can be summed up in, in the rather general world, computers. But it's, uh, we have all sorts of, um, uh, of, of techniques and instruments that help us uh, help scientists uh, gather up uh, uh, samples from environments and, and figure out what there is in there and so forth. Another problem uh, with giving an estimate, uh, which I will uh, at the end of the sentence, is that um, you can't see a microbe. That's why they're called microorganisms. They're too small to be seen by the unaided eye. And what's more, when you take uh, you know, a sample and you, and you try to grow them in the lab too, and then you know, take a batch of them and then you uh, 
uh, you break them down and see what they're all about and do all these tests on them. Uh, and then you've got a definition. Okay, this is this microbe, and we'll call it that, and it has these abilities, and it, you know, it's, mm, its genome is thus and thus, and so forth and so forth, and it can do this, and it thrives in these conditions. What we've found out uh, recently is that if you take 100 microbes and you try to cultivate them, only one of them, uh, on the average, only one species will actually agree to grow in laboratory conditions. The rest of them just won't. And because they're microorganisms, you, you can't know what you're missing. You don't know what it is that doesn't grow because you can't see it. You can't measure it and so forth and so forth. So maybe it's 1%, maybe it's 0.1%. It's very difficult because you know, you're measuring things that you can't measure by definition. Um, so there's a very difficult problem even figuring out what there is to study. Uh, having said that, advanced techniques, which is what um, um, a guy called Craig Venter is doing, uh, has been doing for a few years now. Uh, he's very famous about with the Human Genome Project uh, uh, controversy a few years back. Uh, going out into the seas, the oceans, with a boat, and you know, a research team and a lot of uh, costly equipment, dumping buck buckets in the sea, taking out the samples, uh, water samples, and then extricating the DNA from these samples. So we get a whole host of genes, and it's like taking, I don't know, a thousand puzzles and trying to, um, to, to figure out which bits fit where. And when we, they do that, again, with a lot of advanced software, uh, they figure out what the genomes of the microbes in the, that water in the bucket s look like. Mm -hmm. And then they say, OK, so then this might, must be a species because it, it has this type of genome. We don't have the organism. We don't know what it looks like. We don't know what it does. We have the genome. So, OK, and then we call <laughs> it this and this. Uh, and when you do that, you don't actually know what the microbe is, but you, what you can know a lot about something when you take its genes and you study them. So I'd say uh, and nothing more than educated guess. I'd, I'd guess thousands of species per year, something like that. Yeah, and getting bigger by the bucket. <laughs> <laughs> okay, your question? Yes, Rowan, so I'm glad we've got oh, young kids here. Um, your uh, style of writing, that's my writer's point of view, will be very relevant in the understanding of um, senior high school students and from even mid high school, mm -hmm. secondary school, to learn in their area of looking at biology and that area of biology mm -hmm. uh, as a textbook. Do you see that being used if you're like privileged enough to have a left be done? Uh, I'd like that. I wouldn't real, but I'm, I'm really not for them because I think that there are too many textbooks written in technical garbage and mm. it's, it's truly rubbish. And I, I just seem to read, so my goodness me, you know, grassroots stuff. Mm -hmm. This is what it's about. Uh, and I, I think that the children, you know, you could even use some of that vernacular in sixth grade. Yeah. And I think the kids to, to whet their appetite because so they might be so later on, mm -hmm. they might want to become what you're doing all about this and for their country. Yeah, I, I, I should, uh, mm -hmm. for, for, the, uh, for the benefit of those sitting here who think that, uh, I would like to point out that there's very little money in it, uh, in mm -hmm. becoming a biologist. Yes, so but it's all about education yes. and that's survival. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, knowledge. Yeah, but uh, I, I think that, first of all, uh, teaching science to kids uh, in order for them to become scientists is legitimate, but what I consider, I consider it not to be completely the point. You teach science to kids so that kids will become citizens who know science. Yes, yeah, and also. And, yeah, and, you know, and, and I say this uh, actually in the prologue, where, where a prologue is actually a dialogue uh, between me, myself, and a reader. Uh, and. I say, you know, I'm not trying to make you, sorry, that's the epilogue actually, <laughs> never mind. Um, they're both dialogues with the same reader on, you know, the, uh, the epilogue who's read the book. Um, that I'm not trying to convince you to become a scientist. You know, microbiology is what microbiologists were put on this earth for. You need to know, need or might want to know what the world looks like. Yeah, to help them understand at a school level mm -hmm. and so they can pass yeah. it on to the children. I'm all for it's it. It's all for understanding, it's all for survival. I'm all for it. When, when I first got uh, um, you know, thinking about this book uh, and with uh, Melbourne University Writing for Readers uh, <coughs> workshop, which is where it all started, 
Uh, I thought it would be a kid's book. Right? Uh, I even thought, yeah, the illustrated, blah, blah, you know. In retrospect, having an illustrated book about things you can't see by definition would be kind of <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Nevertheless, I, I have a, a, a friend who's a graphic designer, and we whipped up a couple of uh, sketches, and they looked quite nice. Uh, and there were no actual microbes depicted. So um, getting back to, to, to what I was saying before, um, then uh, I, got, uh, mm, I got people who actually know about writing and, and kids and adults and so forth uh, looking at me, and they said, Look, it's actually for adults. You know, uh, I said, okay, I'll write it for adults, and and now I got a prize for uh, young adult science writing uh, <laughs> from the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So now I'm completely confused. I have no idea. I do see that. So that really verifies what happened from yeah. middle school onwards. Yeah. You know, yeah. sixteen onward. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but people with doctorates in biology have enjoyed this as well. So I'm I'm safe yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think. Eden's been going for over an hour. I think maybe one last question, and we also have to get him back onto a train back to Melbourne some stage. Ah, we've got two hours. Two hours? Oh, right. <laughs> I really thought it was a bit closer than that. But uh, one last question. Can I just ask one question? You were talking about the CO2 emissions. Oh, sorry? CO2 emissions uh -huh, and stuff yes. like this. OK. Now, uh, in, the, in your little... Uh, Little little wog things, micro, what you call microbes things. Okay, now if it's it, it all the, and I might be wrong, <coughs> but it, if so might I. <laughs> no, 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 but I'm trying badly um, explain myself. It, it boils down to the health, say, of the person, boils down to the health of an animal, and whether they have. Uh, maybe the person, was, but particularly the animal, um, if you had a biodynamically fed, biodynamics a different type of farming, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sheep, mm -hmm. now that sheep never suffers from worms mm -hmm. because it is too healthy for that. Mm -hmm. And you are smiling at very biodynamic. So, I, th I just like it when people say worms, that's it, that's why I'm smiling. <laughs> I like the word. <laughs> yeah, I like the word. Okay. So, 7 million hectares of biodynamic farming mm -hmm. in Victoria mm -hmm. would absorb all the CO2 emissions that this state produces. And, yeah, but they, they, the farming would go, I mean, the grass would go into sheep. Yes. And then it would go out of the sheep. Yes. Right. Yes. And back into, as methane usually, and back into uh, the the environment, the atmosphere. Wouldn't it? Yeah, but the, the what I'm saying that the sheep would be healthy, and the people eating the sheep, well, until That's you right, killed it, the and the people <laughs> eating the sheep would be healthy yeah. until you killed them, possibly. But uh, <laughs> but uh, the environment uh, wouldn't. I, I can't see where it would benefit. Having said that, by the way. Let me um, uh, let me throw something at you. Um, there's you might have heard of this. And this uh, I was very glad to to see it because it's a very Aussie thing, and I tried to cram in as much Australian stuff in, in the book as I could. Um, sheep and cows and other ruminants and anything that basically eats grass, uh, they fart methane and they burp methane. Okay, That's and correct. methane is a greenhouse gas, and you don't want that. That's correct. That and the. The 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 um, um, uh, now I'm not sure because I'm not. It's some time ago, and how the, how it was fed to them. Mm -hmm. But if when the oil is taken out of the product canola, mm -hmm. you have a uh, an offal or a something. A what? Sorry. An offal. You, you've got a fibre. A fibrous. You've got all these little uh -huh, seeds. Mm -hmm. And you take all the, the oil well, out. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've got some. I am so far out of my comfort zone that I can't see it. Even. Okay, okay. No, so I'm, I'm learning so new so stuff by the minute. You, you, they don't grind the canola up and make oil out. Mm -hmm. They press it, mm -hmm. and they have a, uh, a resi residue. Is the word I'm right? Like a meal. Ah, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, right. So now that, mm -hmm. if you could find a way to feed that mm -hmm. to a cow, mm -hmm. that stops. The <laughs> and all that. Good. I'd like to, to hear more of that. 
Uh, but I, I have absolutely but nothing the, but intelligent the to say about it. The economics of that uh -huh. has, has stopped that because the, mm. now this is 30 years ago. Right. And the economics of, of that, mm -hmm. how are we going to put that into food and feed the to account? The economics of the things are usually, you know, the, usually do away with most of the, ooh, that might be a good idea. Things, yeah. things you, you take a good idea and you try to scale it up to industrial, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. industrial and farming or, indu or uh, technological, and most of the time it, it's okay. just uneconomical. And the smart bit, the clever bit, is when you make, find a way of making it economical. And it's so a yeah. problem. The other thing is all the, the you know, we go back to the sheep, mm -hmm. being healthy. And I still haven't mentioned kangaroos, mind you, which I was about to well, carry on. Oh, well, I'll pour a little animal <laughs> No, 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 no. It's no, there, eh? though. Yeah, but um, uh, the, the health of the, uh, the animal must be better for admissions and all sorts of things, because uh, thousands of millions of dollars are spent on chemicals that are chucked up. Mm. Curing all these problems. Yeah, yeah. Healthy animals, good, e so good economically as well. Yeah, so Definitely. stop that chemical. Yeah. I, I'm for that. If you find a way how to do that, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, but I will, just the last sentence, just you know, because you reminded me of uh, methane emissions uh, <laughs> of uh, sheep and cows, it appears that kangaroos don't emit methane. They have a, um, a, um, a different consortium of, uh, of bacteria in their uh, stomachs. Uh, and they produce a different uh, type of chemical, which isn't methane, and is not a greenhouse gas. And Australian scientists are currently working on trying to take that sort of consortium of bacteria, that community, and convince cows and sheep stomachs to, <laughs> <laughs> to adopt <laughs> uh, that, that consortium. And if it works, then there will be a if it works on a large scale, it would be a huge reduction in, 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 uh, in greenhouse gas emissions, especially for countries such as Australia but and New Zealand. A with a cow. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, sort of, yeah. Busy milk, jumping. <laughs> milk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, no worries. It's, it's very Thank interesting. You. Uh, we'll Thank you. Well, I think we might call it a halt. Yeah. I think <laughs> some people want to get away. So thank you very much, Yudan. I think it's... Uh, you uh, have produced a really good book. It's a great read. Thanks. And also you're very good at communicating uh, with an audience as well. Thanks. Lisa, I think also thank you very much for your organisation for making the effort to come around here. I know you're being paid to do it, but I think that's the idea of being <laughs> able to come out of the country and do it. And I, I think that your emblem, not your emblem, your motto of bringing science to the people and people to science is well worthwhile and we would be more than happy to, I think, test to have them back again in the future. But what we might also like to do is somehow or another connect it to the primary school and also to Wesley, if we can, so that we've got a uh, wider audience. So I'd like everyone here to uh, show their appreciation yeah, for this yeah. exercise. <laughs> Thanks very much, I enjoyed this a lot. Yeah. Yeah.